man. Here we go. Keep that passage open um, in front of you. Now, uh, what's the giant that is currently um, in your life? Uh, What is the giant enemy in your world right now that you feel like is crushing the life out of you? It might be the climate giant. You think, oh man, I need to sort out my carbon footprint. I'm not doing enough. I need to become vegan. And you can't do enough, and you're kind of exhausted, and maybe you're exhausting those people around you. Maybe it's a family giant. You know, maybe uh, you're in a situation at home, and dad's not getting on well with the kids, and the kids are grumpy, and you're caught in the middle, and you're just thinking, how do I help sort this out? Who's going to bring the peace? Maybe it's a family giant. Maybe it's a job giant. Maybe work's just stressing you out, and your boss is a nightmare, and the people you work with are rubbish. And it's just exhausting you, and it's crushing you. Uh, Maybe it's a health giant. What is the giant that is threatening to crush the life out of you? And I wonder if you have faith in God that David has to take on that giant. Now, can I say that is not what this passage is about? Right? That is not what God is teaching us through 1 Samuel 17. But it probably is the Sunday school story that we so often tell. And when you read the little kids' books, I think the interesting thing is we're so familiar with the story of David and Goliath because it's, in, it's in all the kids' story books. And um, if we were to go out into sort of Norwich and we were to say, what stories do you actually know from the Bible? Um, David and Goliath would be probably in the top two. That would probably be... It's probably, translate oh. it to which language? No, I don't want to translate it into which language. <laughs> wow, I need to... Oh, this, this watch is a nightmare. <laughs> there we go. Let's translate that. Let's translate it into nothing. So, um, but it's, isn't it a familiar story? And yet, as we read the text there, there must have been stuff you thought, well, I've never seen that before. I did. I've read it over and over again. There's so much there. This is the classic underdog story, which we absolutely love. And you read it, you know, if you read it in um, your kid's Bible, so many, so many of them go, well, look, um, if David can do that, then I'm the wimpy kid and I'm going to take on the school bully, where are the stones? And if we come to this passage and think fundamentally, if I can trust God in the way David is, does, then I can take on my giants. I have, I've got this so badly wrong. Now, look, just to give you a little bit of framework about how we're understanding uh, what we're reading here in 1 Samuel 17. I talked about it uh, back in May and June. Lots of you will be familiar with it. Some of you may be a bit more new. But basically, the first half of the Bible, the Old Testament, the best way to understand it is that it points us forward to Jesus. The New Testament helps us to live in the light of Jesus and his death. Um, Jesus puts it like this in John chapter 10, uh, verse 39. He's talking to some Pharisees and he says this, you diligently study the scriptures. And we've been talking there about the Old Testament uh, because you think that in them you will have eternal life. But these very same scriptures testify about me. Uh, They tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, there's a number of ways they point us forward uh, to the Lord Jesus. And, and uh, one of the ways is, um, there's a theological term called typology, which some of you will have heard of. Uh, some of you won't have. Um, a type is a, it's a shadow um, that points forward to the reality uh, that is to come. So um, you will see that Jesus in the New Testament is described as a prophet and a priest and a king. And so when you read the Old Testament and you meet a prophet or a priest or a king, uh, that will give you an image either that Jesus will be a little bit like that king or actually they are the antithesis of what Jesus the king will be like, but they point us forward in a way. That's why when John sees Jesus, he says, there is the Lamb of God 
John the Baptist sees him. He says, there's the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And he's not saying that because Jesus is literally a lamb. But he's referring back to the fact in Exodus and Leviticus, we meet sacrificial lambs again and again that die in the place of people. And they are not the reality. They are the shadow that point forward to the reality in Jesus. And we're going to see that a lot in today's passage. And my wife said in my first sermon, I should have made that clearer. So I've tried to make it clearer for you. It's always good to come to the second service because grace gives me loads of crit, which I bring into this sermon, which makes it better. <laughs> so there we go. There we go. Who'd, there we go. Who'd be married to me or my wife? So that's fine. Right. But this is the thing you need to understand, right? 1 Samuel 17, there are two ways this points us forward to Jesus. And the first way is this. Uh, we meet a giant who is no ordinary giant. Okay, this is no ordinary giant. Um, Just have a look at verses 1 to 3. We've got um, a military standoff. Uh, The Philistines gather their forces, verse 1. Verse 2, Saul and the Israelites assemble and camp in the valley of Elah. And verse 3, they occupy, the Philistines occupy one hill and the Israelites another. And the Philistines are the sworn enemy of God's people and God himself. And they are camped on one side of this valley up on the hill. And they are looking out over the other side of the hill where God's people are. And they're at deadlock. See, if you go down with your army into the valley, then you are at a massive disadvantage. Because if you're fighting on the way up, you're going to get absolutely stuffed. And so both these armies are refusing to go and fight. And so one of the Philistines takes it by the scruff of the neck. And he goes down into the valley. And he lays out a challenge. Goliath. Have a look at verse 8. Goliath stood there. He shouted at the ranks of Israel. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man. Let him come down. And here is, here is the, here's the thing. Verse 9. If he is able to fight and kill me, we become your servants. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our sur- subjects and serve us. So he says, look, let's forget the bloodshed of everyone. Let's not kill everyone here. Okay? Let us um, have a one-on-one battle. Uh, winner takes all. Um, the first person who wins, they win for the whole army. And everyone, then it's, it's there. Winner takes all. It's, it's, it's next goal wins. Um, Goliath versus your champion. And what do we find about um, this guy? It's an unbeatable and impossible task. Because he looks like an impenetrable foe. Just have a look at verse 4. What do we learn about him? Goliath. He was from Gath. Uh, and his height was six cubits and a span. In modern day's terms, that's about nine foot nine. Now, um, the tallest man who's been recorded in modern times is a chap called Robert Wadlow. Here he is in 1940. Uh, He was eight foot 11. Um, He died um, at the age of 22, and he was still growing. You see, um, what we meet in Goliath is not impossible, but it is extraordinary. And he's not a weak giant. And we know that because of what we read about him. Have a look um, in verse 5. He's not just huge. He's got, look at this high-tech armor. Um, He has a bronze helmet on his head. Uh, He's got a a coat of scale armor. He's got bronze shin pads. He's got a huge bronze javelin. And do you know that, uh, let's have a look. Where is that? Uh, The bronze javelin was slung on his back. Verse 7, the spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. Its iron point weighed 600 shekels. Um, that is about the weight of an eight-month-old baby. Okay, so we haven't got an eight-month-old baby. We did in the first service, and we picked her up, and like, they were like, she is a lump. <laughs> Imagine that. So that weight on the head of this huge spear, he was a strong man. And he's impenetrable. And he sounds impenetrable as well. Have a look at verse 10. Have a look at verse 10. Then the Philistine said, 
This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. You see, God's people look on and they look at each other and they say, do any of you you fancy it? What do you reckon? Do you want to take him on? Verse 11. Hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Saul, he's the leader of God's people. Actually, he was the giant of God's people. Do you remember? He was a head taller than everyone else, just not this big. And he looks, and everyone looks around, and verse 24, they flee in great fear. You see, what we meet here in Goliath is a real historical enemy of God's people who can crush them and yet in the plot line of God's of scripture here this giant is no ordinary giant you see he points in a typological way towards an even greater enemy of God's people one who mocks and despises God and his king Um, the writers sort of weave this in Just have a look at verse 5. How is this coat? Have a look down at verse 5. He wore a coat of what armor? Can you see that? Verse verse 5. What sort of armor is it? Scale. It literally reads scales. See, as you look at this enemy, he looks like a giant serpent. Now, you can look at that and say, come on, Reese, you're reading far too much into the text there. Come on, that's looking a little bit um, like allegory. But do you remember what happened um, back, you won't remember, like six, seven, eight months ago? Saul, in 1 Samuel 11, faced um, his first big battle against a chap called Nahash, who had taken over Jabesh Gilead, and he was threatening to poke all that, one of their eyes out of all the inhabitants. And do you remember what um, J- this... this um, Nahash's name meant, it meant snake. You see, we have the Lord's anointed, and he faces an enemy that's like a snake. It happens with Saul. It happens with David. And in the big picture of Scripture, they represent in a small way the great enemy we all face. Uh, Revelation 12, verse 9 It's on the screen there. It tells us who this snake is. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. And look what he's known for, leading the whole world astray. See, when we see Goliath, we're not just seeing the giants the small giants that we face in our lives. And that is not to belittle the difficulties we talked about at the start of the service, because they feel big to us. But this giant we meet in chapter 17 represents the ultimate giant, the far greater enemy of God's people, who mocks all of humanity, who tempts us to sin, who wields death and destruction that lies beyond that. And that's not someone any of us can beat. Which one of us can take on death and win? See, this giant is no ordinary giant. He um, points to no ordinary threat. But then that means that secondly, we need a champion who is no ordinary champion. You see, um, Saul, the one who's a head taller than everyone else, he's not willing to step up. Eliab, who we met last week, one of David's brothers, he was pretty tall as well. He's not willing to step up. And what do we meet in verse 12? Have a look down. Now, David was David. (laughs) It's David. Now, David, the son of an Ephraimite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time was very old. And what does he do? Verse 14. He sends him to sort of see how the boys 
are doing. Uh, David looking after sheep one day, going to the front lines and seeing how his brothers are getting on the next day. And um, on this day, his dad sends him uh, with a bunch of food, 10 big blocks of cheese, and he heads up to see what is going on. And unlike Saul, if you remember, when he was about to be uh, brought out before God's people, he was hiding amongst the supplies. Have a look at David in verse 22. David arrives there. He left his things with the keeper of the supplies, and he ran straight to the front line of the battle to find out what is going on. And this secretly anointed king, who we saw anointed last week, is utterly flabbergasted. Why? Well, because of what has been happening. Verse 16. Look at verse 16. Forty days the Philistine came forward, morning and evening, and took his stand. And as David realizes this Philistine who's been throwing out these insults and these challenges, that he's still doing it for 40 days, he says, this is a disgrace. Look at verse 26. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine, removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They, all they can see is this giant and his impenetrable armor. And David sees him and thinks, who does he think he is? Seriously? I mean, like, it's ridiculous. Who does he think he is taking on the armies of the living God? I mean, have you lost your perspective, people? Like, it's an ant taking on an anteater. It doesn't work that, does it? But if you realize who Goliath is compared to the living God, this is just not a contest. And as he is giving this big chat, word gets to Saul. And Saul says, come on over. Let's have a chat. And look, this is, this is absolutely the wrong way around. Verse 32. David says to Saul. I mean, it should be Saul saying to David, right? But here is this shepherd boy who's come with 10 blocks of bear, right? And he says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul replies, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young boy. He's a big warrior. He's been doing it from his youth. But David says to Saul, look, I've got experience dealing with animals. Verse 34, look at it. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear comes off to the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine. He doesn't even call him Goliath. He just says that this is an enemy of God's people. will be like one of them. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. And, you know, we went up to um, Castle Mall. No, the Castle, Ly Castle Museum yesterday. And in there, um, I think there's loads of stuffed animals. Um, back in the day when you could shoot animals and stuff them. And we probably can't, you can't do that anymore. But um, the lions in there, wow. My girls walked around and they were like, ah! But in excitement, also scary. Because they are really, they are, the, the lions are massive. David's had one of them. He took it to the cleaners. And he said to Saul, look, Goliath's no different to them. But why has David been able to face those beasts? Why has he been able to face those beasts? Verse 37, the Lord rescued me. And so Saul says, good, oh, go, go and the Lord be with you. Off you go then. Now, I mean, just, again, just stop for a moment and think about it. Here is Saul, the king of God's people, and what is he doing? He is, he is handing the fate of a nation into the hands of a little boy. Older than just a young boy. 
Isn't that a bit nuts? Don't you think there should be an even greater champion? But he heads off. Saul says, look, take some of my armor. David says it doesn't fit. And so he goes with a pea shooter. Not quite a pea shooter. He's got his sling. He's got his five smooth stones. And as he faces up, he runs down. And there he is before Goliath. And look how Goli- what Goliath thinks about this battle. Verse 42, he looked David over. He saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. And he despised him. He sees his weakness, he sees his inexperience, he sees his vulnerability, he sees his childlikeness, and he says, you've just sent Bambi out to take on a grizzly bear. Now what David says next is probably the linchpin of the whole book. And this is what 1 Samuel all uh, kind of revolves around. And this is something you need to understand about God's champion. Have a look at what he says in response. Verse 45, uh, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And this would have been probably with a high-pitched voice. And listen to verse 47. And all those, this is why all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you all into our hands. Let me read that verse 47. All gathered here will know it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saved. You see, there is Goliath and where is his confidence? It is in human power. It's in the fact that he's got this high-tech, cutting-edge armor on. And where's Saul's, where's Saul's confidence? He says, David... Get on my sword. Get on my armor. His confidence is in human power. And David says, look, this, what's about to happen, what you're about to experience is for everyone to realize the way God saves is not through human power, but through weakness. And so verse 48, the Philistine moved closer to attack him. And David ran quickly towards the battle line. And reaching into his bag, his shepherd's bag, he takes out a stone. He slung it. It struck the Philistine in the forehead and the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Not a chance. Oh, I don't know, I sung this in there. I didn't sing it, I said it in um, the first service. I don't know if any of you remember this children's chorus. um, And it went a little bit like this. Only a boy called David. Only a rippling brook. Does anyone know this? Only a boy called David. Five little stones he took. Rob Varley knows it. And one little stone went in the sling. And the sling went round and round. Thank you. One little stone went in the sling. And the sling went round and round. And you can join in this bit. Round and round and round and round and round and round and round. One little stone went up, 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 and the giant came tumbling down. Thank you, Steve. You were more responsive than the first service. And they really weren't very responsive. But um, the thing about that children's chorus is this. It misses out the next bit. And the next bit as you look on is actually pretty brutal, but it's vitally important. Just have a look. Have a look. Um, Verse 50. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Let's be clear, without a sword in his hand, not by the world's ways. 
He struck down the Philistine. He killed him. Verse 51, David ran and stood over him and he took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it. And I'm really sorry if you're squeamish. You can't like block your ears up, but listen to it. And he cut off his, what did he do? He drew it from the sheath and he killed him and he cut off his head with the sword. There is this shepherd boy and he is standing with the head of the Philistine. Why are we told that? I mean, that's just a little bit sick, isn't it? He's killed him. Why chop off his head? And that is because God wants us to know that he is fulfilling or he is partially fulfilling what God has promised right from the beginning. See, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent led Adam into sin. And this was the curse that God laid on the serpent. Genesis 3.15. Listen to this. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and one of her offspring, okay? And between your offspring and hers. And he will what? Crush your head. See, we are waiting for someone who will crush the head of the serpent, Satan. And here we have the boy king who looks weak, but he's the Lord's anointed and he's able to finish the job. You know, Adam was meant to rule over the beasts and he was defeated by the snake. Israel, right? They were meant to enter the promised land. And do you know why they didn't enter the promised land for 40 years? Because they were afraid of the giants in the land. And here is David facing one of Anak's descendants who's been mocking God's people for 40 days. And he tames him and he crushes him who wields the power of death. See, it shouldn't surprise us as we see this incident this real incident that happened in history that it points forward to being fulfilled in the most glorious way as we meet Jesus. You know, freshly after he's baptized by John in the Jordan and the Spirit comes on him, anointed by God to be the king of God's people. What does he go and do? So you know what he goes and does? Luke chapter four, he goes out into the wilderness to be tempted by who? Satan, the serpent, for how long? 40 days. It's David and Goliath revisited. It's Israel in the wilderness revisited. It's Adam in the garden revisited. And Jesus, the true son of David, the true son of Abraham, the true son of Adam, he wins. See, what we see in the valley with David and Goliath is a mini picture of what God is doing. And Tim Chester in his book puts it like this. Um, Jesus is the true Adam. He crushes the snake. He tames the beast. He's the true Israel. He trusts God. He defeats giants. He secures the inheritance. And as Jesus comes away from the wilderness, having defeated Satan, he proclaims the good news that his kingdom has come near. You can be part of his kingdom. You can be saved from Satan, his lies, and the death that he wields. You see, David we meet in 1 Samuel 17 is no ordinary champion. He's not just like you and me. Come on, we can do a David. No, he takes on the enemy that none of us could win. And he defeats him for us in our place. And so we're kind of left asking, well, how do we respond? What are we to do with this? And I guess, where are you in 1 Samuel 17? And there are three groups, just to finish, three groups that we could be part of. One of them is this. Some of us might be Philistines. Actually, some of us might be the uncircumcised. We're not asking, encouraging circumcision here. But we are, they, they are the enemies of God's people. You see, as you get into the New Testament, either you are with Jesus and you're part of his kingdom of light. Otherwise, you're in the kingdom of darkness. And how does it finish for people who are in the kingdom of darkness, not with Christ? It does not end well. Maybe that's you. You probably don't want to stay there. 
Secondly, there is Eliab. Did you notice um, uh, David's older brother Eliab? We didn't really mention it, but in verse 28, David turns up and Eliab says to him, Why have you come down here? Why do you leave those sheep? I know you're conceited, how wicked your heart is. And maybe you are looking at Jesus and you are doubting his goodness at the moment. You're doubting his goodness in your life and his ability to actually rescue you and it's too much has happened and you're resentful and if that is how you feel talk to him about it but finally there's the third group and that is the saved Israelites see we are the ones watching on as Jesus who dies and rises again it's like as if he comes out of the grave carrying the head of the serpent. Well, he's tied up, and that will finally happen on the Day of Judgment. But he has defeated his power over our lives. And so what do the saved Israelites do? They're no longer scared. They surge. They surge forward, verse 52, with a shout. They plunder the Philistines. And what are we to surge with? It is the good news that people can be saved from death and hell because there is a champion who is willing to stand in our place. I don't know what the giants you are feeling are in your life at the moment, but please take comfort that the greatest giant you ever face has been defeated and he promises to walk with you in the midst of whatever pain is going on at the moment never to leave you, to sustain you, to help you. And there will be a victory that comes. Let's bow our heads.